uh, for this next portion of the afternoon, which is our panel discussion and Q&A. And I would like to introduce Eric Anderson, who we will be moderating our panel today. Eric is a journalist. Yes, let's give him a round of applause. And this is before he's even done his job, so we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> He's a journalist at KPBS uh, covering the region's environment. He has reported on clean water and air initiatives, beach erosion, power and water supplies, the restoration of the Salton Sea, water quality along the coast, and endangered species. So he brings a tremendous amount of expertise uh, both in the subject matter and as a, and as a discussion leader. So um, thank you, and uh, let's welcome Eric Anderson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I really want to say thanks to, to you uh, for actually physically coming here today. It's, um, it's nice to get back to a world where everybody's not in a little box on a computer monitor. I appreciate it. I hope you do as well. One of the great things about being here in person is your chance to do more than just be that passive listener. Um, we listened to some great, great... Um, uh, stories earlier today uh, uh, that these wonderfully intelligent people and passionate people uh, are bringing to our community. Um, and we want to get you involved. We want to encourage you to help make a connection. That was kind of one of the themes that, that jumped out at me as I listened to the presentations. Uh, a lot of the work is about making connections, right? Either making connections with the natural world or making connections with colleagues or making connections uh, with people who don't quite yet know that they should be connected to an issue or uh, uh, a restoration effort or a natural environment. Uh, maybe they just don't even know it exists at this point. So we wanna encourage you to make a connection uh, with our wonderful um, panelists today. Um, I will ask you to raise your hand and we wanna get to your questions um, we ask you to kind of hold off during the presentation so you can get a sense of what, what, what they're about. Um, but this is really the opportunity to break down that wall. Um, if you have something that's jumping out for you, um, think about it, formulate it into a question, raise your hand, I'll call on you. If I'm looking over this way and you're a question over this way, stand up, get my attention, uh, I'll make sure that I get to you. Um, I do want to offer, uh, just kind of as a starting point, this idea of being connected to the world around us. And why is that such an important thing when we think about our future and our future relationships with our environments? Um, and I'll ask that question to anyone who wants to jump up and take it. I'll even take a, uh, an answer from the audience if you have one. <laughs> it's a big question, but think about it for a minute. It's why, why is it important to be connected to these issues that we're talking about here today? Well, I mean, I think being connected to community, other people, that's what, to a certain degree, makes us human. Um, and being connected to nature, I think, is of utmost importance because we live out of nature. Like, and I mean, that's a very selfish thing to say, but I mean, we need nature to survive. We need to, we need it um, to be who we are. And um, and I think so that connection and being able to foster a sustainable future and sustainable environment, I think is, is very important. And I think it's something that we need to encourage more and we need to do more. We were talking earlier today about how some of these communities where we live in that are very coastal. I mean, I'm gonna talk about, you know, coastal because that's where I know a little more, but like people in Tijuana, people in Ensenada, so I mean, even people in California, it's like they live in these coastal cities, but they don't have this connection with the ocean. So then since if people don't have the connection with the ocean, then there's not that important for politicians, et cetera, et cetera. So when people connect to their environment, things happen because they understand that sometimes the environment needs help or needs, um, yeah, it needs help. So, so that's how 
things happen and and I think that's that's it like we need connection to community and nature to survive and to have healthy lives raise your hand if you have a question Annie I noticed you were sh you were shaking your head what were you thinking about as, as you were listening to that answer I mean I, I think um, I think Khalil is exactly right and I think um, you know when I think about when I think about connecting to nature, it's the most foundational way that we really, and probably one of the most um, most early relationships that we create. Um, you know, when we talk about connecting to nature, we're talking about building a sense of place and building a sense of belonging in the spaces in which we live. And I think for, you know, it's really easy to separate humans from the rest of the world. And I think that puts us in a really dangerous space when we do that. And so when we build these connections to nature and we are connected to the places that we live and that we share with other living organisms, I think that it allows us to, you know, create a better understanding of how everything is working together. And not only just how we can coexist um, more harmoniously with wildlife and with nature, but with each other. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's kind of what I was thinking about. Um, but I think connect, uh, connecting to nature is really um, the foundation at, at all of the work that we do. And I noticed that in your discussion, you kind of stress the importance of having that mirror up, right? Seeing ourselves as we seek out mm -hmm. nature and understanding in nature. Um, and that's a connection too, right? Yeah, I think, um, I think if you, you know, one of the first things um, I ask any of the, um, I didn't ask it today, but one of, the, one of the first things I generally ask anybody that I'm working with is to, um, what is your nature story? What is the, that moment, that foundational moment where you first remember connecting to nature? And, um, and I can tell you what mine is. Mine, I, would, you know, I was two years old, I was in a park, with my mom and my sister who had just been born and it was cicadas in, in Illinois. And that's the first thing I remember. And um, it's the, you know, that initial moment that we connect to nature is really, um, I think, you know, whether that's fostered or not, I think can make a, the whole difference. And so I think when we're thinking, when we're looking inward and we're understanding how we fit in a space and how we, how, what is our connection to nature? Do we have a lasting relationship with nature? And where did it start? And how has that grown? I think is something that we can all do um, to really understand you know, how we can better foster that relationship within ourselves. Outstanding. Well, we have a question here. And if you could speak up a little bit, I'll try and repeat, but. I'll use my best outdoor voice. There you go, that's awesome. Yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. I think um, one of the most glaring things that happened in the pandemic, apart from just you know ha like suffering through a pandemic um, as a society, but I, you know also through that we saw a much more glaring spotlight on the disproportionate effects of communities. Um, and in their connections to nature and also, um, you know, just the inequities that exist, the social inequities that exist. So, like, it was like simultaneously we went through a pandemic and a, and, and a humanitarian crisis. And for us, um, you know, 
we're uh, one of, you know, Los Angeles is one of the most park poor cities in the country. And um, the Los Angeles Zoo is a green space that people could come. And so for us, opening really was a community, uh, opening was important to be a community resource. We were closed for a really long time and, and that made a difference. That was like, that impacted people. Um, and so finding out ways to access green spaces became more apparent and more needed in recognizing the lack of access that many communities had was was glaring. And so um, so I think, yes, that is certainly something that we saw, at least in the work that I do. Anybody else? We have one back here. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, it might be that we're never going to be able to see uh, Pignopodia, those sea stars, back in Baja again because it might just be too warm for it. And that would be very sad to think about. Um, and that goes with other species. Um, however, we know that some of these species can adapt and there's variation and local adaptation. Um, so what we were hoping is that if we could raise some of these sea stars for a while in the lab, they get acclim uh, acclimated to, to warmer temperatures and potentially do some, uh, something about it. Obviously, to, to do restoration and local restoration, at some point you need to address some of the stressors. And if you don't address some of the stressors, you might not be able to do restoration, and that's how it is. So... Um, so yeah, it's a very good question, and I don't know exactly the answer and if it's going to be possible or not. Um, the other thing with um, sea urchin barrens. Sea urchin barrens and kelp forests are these um, two stable states that once you have a kelp forest, you're going to have a lot of uh, predators of urchins, and they're going to keep the urchins down, like sea otters. Um, in Southern California, in Baja California, yes, we extirpated uh, sea otters, but there's other predators, so we have a lot of lobsters, we have uh, sheephead. Um, so the story about sea otters and urchins is probably less uh, important as it was in Alaska, for example, that's like a classic example of trophic cascades. Um, however, we also, we need to think about kind of time scales. So I think if we just leave some of these uh, urchin barrens, probably eventually these urchin barrens are going to die because there's also diseases that the urchins get. And the more urchins you have, the more likely these diseases are spread. Um, they're also like, get, they get stressed because there's no food, because they ate everything. Um, so maybe if you leave an urchin barren for 20 years, it will likely disappear by itself. But that means having 20 years with no kelp, 20 years with this massive primary producer that is giving or is producing uh, food for urchins, for abalone, for all of these things. So I think we're at a point that if we can do something to restore these local populations, which might mean cooling or translocating or getting rid of some urchins and some of the herbivores and then try to transplant or put um, seeding kelp, I think it will be, it will be important. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, definitely the future is uncertain. And if we continue on this path of uh, burning fossil fuels and uh, not controlling uh, global warming, some of these uh, habitats under southern distribution range are probably going to be gone and there's not much and no there's not enough local restoration that we do that will solve this problem so um. we had a question over here Yeah. 
Yeah, it's usually a removal of them. Um, there's some very interesting work that uh, some uh, Japanese and Danish uh, companies doing is like removing these purple urchins and then they put them on the lab and they feed them with this special feed and then in six weeks they have really good gonads and they can sell them. Um, so it's a way of like removing the urchins, using them, generating money and then also um, restoring that, that side. I, I will be wary of, you know, thinking about infecting uh, urchins by itself. I mean, I, I truly believe in biocontrol and, you know, some of these viruses and bacteria can be very specific for um, what they infect and it will be interesting to think about it. Um, but I think just potentially using those urchins or removing urchins is at least at the local level, uh, more feasible now, I guess. We have one over here, and we'll get to you, John, in a second. Uh, I wanted to follow up with Dr. Borda um, about local adaptation. And uh, so we at the Navy are considering doing blackout loading transplantation and trying to enhance the population for cancer of gyrus, for example. And so we're thinking about, you know, does it make sense to, to try to partner Uh, yeah, and we're actually doing translocations of black abalone right now. Uh, we're taking abalone from like close to the middle of Baja, where uh, some of the populations have recovered really well, and we have like really high densities. I mean, me and mostly the fishermen that are working, and they have turfs or rights to to those areas, but they're very interested on um, recovering some of those sites. So they've been doing some of these translocations from further south. Uh, north and we've been having really good uh, um, results so we have been translocating these urchins and we have like recovery rates of 30 50 percent um, and that's probably an underestimation um, so it's something worth exploring and thinking about I mean uh, so yeah we should definitely talk and I can get you into we can start uh, talking about it with uh, with the fishermen and the cooperatives and uh, yeah, I mean I think it's it's definitely something worth thinking about. I mean then you we also think we need to think about you know genetics and spreading and changing genetics of the populations and whatnot. But um, especially with marine uh, species, their systems are a little more open because larvae go everywhere, so so you have less structured populations. Uh, so maybe in the marine and coastal areas, it might be a little easier to just move things around. But yeah, for sure. I mean, it's worth thinking about and talking about it. One of the great things about this region is the fact that it's a binational region, as everyone knows, which is both a source of great uh, pleasure for some and consternation for others. Um, Maria Elena, I'm curious, do you think that that hurts the ability to save the, the, or identify or work with these native plant communities which don't have the ability to migrate? Uh, or, or, or does the being in a binational region uh, make that more difficult? Okay, so um, I think this is my personal opinion, but uh, for me it's more easy when that plan is binational, because um, we have very good collaboration with the museum, with Dr. John Redman, and he used a lot of iNaturalist, and I know if I play, upload a photo of a plant, um, maybe in a few hours I will know what plant it is. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that, because <laughs> uh, this collaboration uh, makes uh, not only scientific or botanists uh, feel that their observation about plants are interesting, but for people that are new using the app, the iNaturalist app, when they knew that an expert is constantly verificating their, their observations, they get mo motivated. 
they were like, oh, I got a belly, it, it was violated by John. And they were like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> so um, now uh, and that we are working, for example, in this um, state norm in Baja California, um, we are looking like the whole perspective. I know there's a lot of species, I mean, around 75% of the species that we have in Baja California uh, are binational. I mean, we share like a lot. We share a lot of space, we share a lot of species. So, of course, for me it's more easy uh, to, uh, yeah, collaborate and work with plants in this way. I mean, uh, and the plants that are not binational is because they are endemic. So, for Baja, or maybe for the peninsula of Baja California. So, they are very interesting, interesting too. So, yeah, I know I, I explained it well, but... So, you think maybe an advantage because of that ability to collaborate? Yeah, for me, for me, yes, because, yeah, we have like a, a bunch of more experts uh, in, yeah, studying this, the same plants. So, yeah, for me, it's easy because if we were only like studying plants that were not binational, it would only be a few botanists from Mexico, but it's more fun when we are more people in the field and people from everywhere, like from I don't know, California, Basu, Baja California. It's more fun going to the field with a lot of people. So yeah, for me, it's, it's great. <laughs> okay, we got a question up here. Yeah, I think um, I'm glad that you brought that up. I think that the assumption um, as to, and, and this is actually the assumption um, that I think all, that gets made a lot for why people don't, there's not a lot of people of color in environmental studies and conservation fields in the first place is because they're not interested in it, and that's not true. Um, I think that when you look at, um, people of color and communities of color um, predominantly, like they, there's statistics to show that they care more about the environment um, than white people. And I think, I think my mic is, is my mic okay? Okay. Um, so I think when we are thinking about, you know, and also to your point about, um, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about how to connect people to nature only from a white perspective, only from a way that white people recreate, right? We should be thinking about how, you know, how are, how does every community connect to nature and what are the ways that they are thinking, how, you know, what are the ways that they do that? Is it, um, you know, being in, like in, green spaces with families? Is it um, through food? Is it through music? Is it through, you know, what are those ways? And um, so I think when we are, when you talk about celebrating those things and the ways that different people or different communities might connect to nature, I think that's a really good, like a really good point. We should be doing that. We haven't done that well. And so, um, you know, when we're creating programs, that's part of why co-creation is so important because, you know, I can tell you how I connect to nature, but I might not, the way that I might connect to nature might not be the way that another community connects to nature. And so, but if I'm, you know, if we're co-creating a program together or we're identifying those things um, together as a group from the beginning, then it allows for us to be able to celebrate those ideas. So I think when we talk about celebrating things, it's one about co-creating opportunities with communities, not for. And two, it's about creating, um, oh, I just lost my thought. Um, it is about, 
shoot, I lost my thought. No worries. <laughs> but, uh, oh, and the other part was that um, there are tons of great people and people of color doing really amazing work. Um, there are leaders in, um, so many leaders in the conservation field who are people of color, and we do not do enough to amplify their voices. And so I think one of the other things I was going to say was, um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about conservation, um, if we're trying to identify partnerships or programs or work that, you know, we are interested in, um, how can we get out of the spotlight more and start to spotlight groups of uh, organizations and groups who are doing this work already and doing it well. And that is about amplifying voices. It is about distribution of power. It is about, you know, um, it is about resourcing those groups. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that would be at least just from like my initial brainstorm how I would answer it. Diversity important in all parts of the biological world, right? Um, yes, and I also think, you know, um, diversity is important, but I also think in when we're talking about uh, community work, it's also important to acknowledge that this, um, you know, this is also anti-racism work, and also this is also work that, um, we need to be acknowledging systemic racism and environmental racism as some of these elements too, and not hiding behind the term diversity. If that makes sense. Point well made, John. Yeah, we actually did. We, we um, from the Nest uh, time lapse cameras, those those five years of uh, of pictures, we um, the, you know that that data is really out of correlated. And I didn't put it up because it's. I mean, I barely understand what I'm doing. Which because we're using uh, Bayesian um, inference, and it's, uh, it's we're, we're using um, Bayesian structural time series, and that that allows you to, to do to get a lot from the data that is super correlated. And one of the results that we got that I should have put up, but it's, it's, it shows what right what you asked, um, that there was really no difference between um, the absences or presence of, of birds except in 2019. In 2019, in Camp Pendleton, the birds were um, much more present in their nests than any other year in both bases. So it's pretty interesting that something happened in 29 uh, Camp Pendleton and we, our thought is that there was less training, less people, less recreation at the base that caused for a, just a better year of incubating for the birds. So it was really interesting. The word that's popping into my head is listening. Um, I think that, you know, and also thinking big. Um, 
we have, you know, with like, for example, um, with our, we have a teen council for conservation and it's um, 30 students, I said, from 15 districts across Los Angeles. Each of them have a different, um, different experience. And part of, you know, what, the way we started um, working with that community was by building relationships and building trust, and that took time, and, how, and listening, um, hosting listening sessions to just understand what their experiences were, what is it like to be a teen in Los Angeles, what, you know, what are the things that are important to you, what do you want to see, what does a just and sustainable Los Angeles look like to you? And our entire program was based on what they wanted and what they said. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it kind of goes back to um, the idea of, you know, how, how are we, you know, like for, for us, we're a city department, we're a huge, you know, we're, we're um, a zoo in the center of Griffith Park. Um, and so what are the resources that we have that we can use to help resource communities um, do what they feel that their communities need? But also, we're a city department. And so if we know that they want access to green spaces or they know that these things are important to them, how can we lean into the identities that we have to help move that that forward? How can we be connecting them to their council districts? How can we be, you know, that goes into policy and advocacy. How can we be doing the things that if, you know, if, if that is the, the one thing that they want or the thing that they want to start with, how do we help resource them to get to that space and to um, not only just raise awareness about it, but um, to file motions, to to connect, to talk to their representatives, to uh, to get attention from the mayor. Um, you know, those are all things that we can be doing to to help amplify their voices in this work. Um, I I would just want to share a really quick thing. One thing that um, I've noticed in my reporting here in San Diego. Uh, is kind of the change uh, in the community of Barrio Logan. When I first arrived here, uh, there was a lot of pollution in that neighborhood, mostly brown neighborhood, uh, but they had some very well-organized activists. And I think uh, the biggest change over the last 20 years for that neighborhood has been them developing their voice. Um, and it's a public voice and it's a political voice. Uh, and they have the ear now of uh, the policy makers, they have the ear of the decision makers, uh, and they are, are impacting their future on a, on a daily basis. Uh, but that was built over time. It takes time to, to build that kind of a, uh, a voice. Uh, but once you do it, uh, I think it's easier to see uh, the results of speaking out. And we have a gentleman up there. Okay, that was a really good question. Everybody heard the question? Yes? Oh, you want to repeat the question? So uh, if I understand it correctly, and please correct me if I don't get this right, um, uh, he wants to know if there's a tip or a thing uh, that you can explain to him that would help this sort of cross-border um, conservation efforts that would facilitate that, make it easier. Yes, um, okay. Um, Baja California is a little bit different for, I, I mean, I, I've been hearing like the position that we are, they are discussing about like, okay, how can involve uh, the minority in this kind of uh, events or uh, movement and connecting with people. Uh, Baja California, we are way behind. I mean, um, 
we still not even I, I'm, I'm just trying to make people just look at native plants or biodiversity. Um, the reality in Baja California is a little bit, I mean, it's very different. People um, is somehow just looking for a work and food and staying home. So um, yes, when I heard about the problems I have here, I say, okay, the reality in Baja California is way too different. We have different kind of problems, dif um, our, I mean, for sure. Um, and being able to be here for me is just learning what is the future is going to look like in Baja, because you're way, I mean, yeah, you'll be like some years in the future. So if you ask me now, like, what, how can we just connect? Um, okay, so my first thing is, uh, there's few students from Baja here. Uh, there are in the student university, try to make connections with people from Baja. I'm from Baja, I know it's Natalia. I, I mean, we are a bunch of people here, Fauno del Noroeste, Jorge, Ani, Terra Peninsular, uh, Mirna. I mean, try to make connections, let's build a community. I mean, we are few, but we are here right now. So try to, I mean, sometimes language is hard, as you can notice, sometimes for me it's like, oh, how did I say that in English? But I'm trying my best. And I think all the people that are here that are from Mexico are trying their best to do to say everything in English. Uh, try to build a community with other students, with other um, civil associations, with people as me that I'm working as an environmental consultant and I'm working with the government. Um, I think we are here for, for the same because we care about the biodiversity in all this region. So let's just start from there. Sometimes we are here and we just start with the same people that we already know. And it's a great opportunity to expand our connections. Uh, the second thing is um, try to, I mean, if you are more than welcome, and everyone is more than welcome to go to Tijuana. Maybe that sounds a little bit, a little bit scary, I know, but you are more than welcome at living in a ranch, in a beautiful ranch, a place where you can go hiking, and please go to a, bot a botanical expedition. Uh, for me, I, I constantly come to San Diego, and maybe two, two weeks ago, I went to Anza Borrego. For me, having tried to have like the whole perspective, because what I found in Baja, I found that, I mean, like in the desert of Baja California, is the same that you have maybe in Nansa Borrego. And sometimes we share like a lot. And just move a little bit, like you go to Baja and me coming here, I got a, be a better perspective. So if you want to go to Tijuana, please call me. You have, uh, and go to the reserve. I mean, in San Quintin, Terra Peninsula have reserves that you can visit and know what's going on in there. And, and, Use I naturalist, of course, it's a super great way to share observation and um, I don't know, like share like what we are trying to conserve. So, yeah, I think that would be all. That's what just popped my mind. But later, if I remember something else, please, I, I will, I will tell you. But thank you for your question. Can I add something? Absolutely. You know, another place just to make connections, like she said, is at the trilateral committee meetings that they have every year. They have them in Canada one year. Mexico another year and United States and they rotate and they're open to the public and there's government, academic and um, NGO folks all working with uh, transport conservation. So that'd be another good place to make connections and meet people. Okay, we've got a question here. Okay, so um, I've been using iNet for a while, and now um, I take some like lessons with Dr. John Redman to improve my uh, observations. So now I feel like very confident to try to teach uh, other people how to use it. I know Fauna del Noroeste that are here also teach other people. Uh, for the, I mean, I. I mean, I, I have I know a lot of experience, but when I've met people in the field, I have never met someone that says, mm, I don't want to use 
the app. Why don't want to know? I mean, they already uh, make the first step that going outside the houses. So I I have not experience to using the app like in like the city. I mean, in, like in a public place where there's nothing to observe. So in my experience, people is is really open to start using the app and try to identify animals or plants. More animals. Sometimes plants are more easy because they're right there and they, they are going to like stay there and it's more easy to photograph them. But I, I, I know more people that want to photograph animals. Um, I know because they have like mm, hair and big eyes and stuff like that and they have they connect with them very more easy than with plants. So that's why I'm always talking about plants, maybe, because we, we need more people interested in, in plants. But uh, I feel lucky because for the, this moment, I haven't met someone in the field that said, no, I don't want to connect with the plant. I don't want to know that. But it's a, it's a really good question with, because I'm sure that eventually I'm going to meet someone that says, no, that's not for me. Uh, the things that, I mean, like two weeks ago, uh, Everything happens two weeks ago, but you, you get it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's two weeks ago I was announced for Rego and also this, but you get it. But, um, like, maybe, joking, maybe like a week ago, I don't know. Um, a, a group of uh, psychology students from college went to a expedition botanica hiking with me. And I told them, like, okay, there's other options uh, if you don't want to uh, stay with your phone, because a lot of people want to just connect from their phone when they are with nature. And that's why I have this, this book. And a lot of people was like, okay, yes, I prefer to take notes on, of making draws, because a lot of people have different ways to connect, to learn about nature. So it's not mandatory to use Aina, maybe we say too, too much, but the idea is just to get outside and maybe take good pictures or maybe do, do a drawing. I, I met some um, very good artisans in the field that they were like, no, I don't want to take photos. They have like the sketchbook and they are drawing. Um, and that's nice. And also the book from Botanical Expedition is being a really good tool for that, to give you options to the people to connect how they they want to connect. Or maybe they just want to listen. They just want to um, like smell the flowers or the leaves. And that's it. And that's fine. It's not, not mandatory if, if you feel like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I've maybe said too much about the naturalist, but I really, I really like that. But nobody, I mean, understands it. No, everyone loves it. So uh, we're almost at the end of the hour, but I want to uh, ask a question. Um, uh, because climate change is such a big uh, force mm -hmm. on the natural world, and we've many times think about it in negative terms, uh, the bad things that are happening as a result of climate change. Talk to me uh, about resilience uh, in the natural world and why we might draw some optimism from that. <laughs> You have two minutes. Go. No, there you go. I mean, we know climate has changed forever, right? I mean, climate change is not a new thing. Climate change is natural, and that's something that has happened. And we know that distribution of species and abundance of species have changed throughout the geological time. So um, I think if we give nature a chance and we reduce some of the other stressors, a lot of the population, a lot of the communities are going to be able to adapt to this or to some of the effects of climate change, like warming. Um, species will change the distribution and it's going to have, have local effects, but if you have marine reserves or places where nature can move and accommodate and migrate, um, we might be able to make them more resilient and likely to have a a better environment in the future. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that concerns us and we need to act and we need to act soon. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about climate change, but all of the other stressors that are combining. So we need to be able to reduce them to, to give nature a chance and nature will adapt because it's been doing that forever. What do you think, Nacho? Nature gonna adapt? Yeah. <laughs> Shorebirds are tough, we know that. Right? Yeah, seabirds, so if you give them a chance, like many, many long-lived species will, will adapt. So 
I've, I have confidence that, like just like uh, Julio said, you, we do have to step back and remove the stressors, not let the warming um, increase past the thresholds that we, that we know are gonna be the point of no return. I think that's one big thing that I always remind myself is, is as long as, you know, hopefully we never pass that threshold. But if that, I do have hope that if that doesn't happen, that you know, birds like albatrosses and terns that just can have a hang around long enough for the good year, then there's hope for them. Any other questions? We got one over here. No, I think um, I think that when we're fostering connections to nature, just in an overarching view, I think that 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 can happen. Um, I think, you know, and it also, you know, I, it makes me go back to that question of like when we are talking about connecting to nature, what are we what do we mean by that? When we say, you know, be able to be in green spaces, what do we mean by that? Um, you know, there's obviously we do a lot of work in Griffith Park and we have, um, we've been talking about this with, uh, all day actually. Um, you know, we have a lot of groups that, um, that also work in Griffith Park that we struggle to work with because there are solutions to, um, conserving Griffith Park are more related to preservation and closing down trails and keeping people out. And, if we are talking about, you know, vast uh, steps in, in how we operate as a species and as a society to combat climate change at the threshold that we need to, we need to do, we need a lot more people to be engaged, engaged with nature and engaged in conservation. And so if we are trying to do conservation work with communities, but we're keeping them out of spaces, then what does that look like? And how does that work? Because to me, if, if we need to do conservation in these really big ways, in these really, um, in more, and we need to do more together, that to me means that we need everybody we can get. And to do that, we need everybody to feel like this world is a place in which they belong and that they can be a part of, right? And so I think um, when we're connecting people with nature and we're also including them in these processes of like learning how to, learning, you know, learning what plants are in your, in the spaces in which you live, learning um, what, what nature is around you, what, um, building the skills to be able to make those observations and ask those questions and have those connections. I think when we're doing that and when we're actively put investing time and, and effort into engaging people in those things and just spending the time to work with people to foster those relationships, I think that that is how we get there. And I think that all of those things will follow along. Just really quick. I just, um, something that struck me uh, when I talked to my ex-boss, Jeff Crooks, the research coordinator at the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve, um, he said, to at some point you want to restore your ecosystem to a point that people will use it. He's like, I would love to this place to be in such a good condition that you can have people fishing on it, right? So people will use it because it's restored to the point and then you can manage it, manage it responsibly and you can have users and people and can enjoy nature. But you need to be to a point that your environment, your habitat, your ecosystem can handle that. that. But that's where you want to go, like so people can enjoy it and use it and, and at, the same pro at, the same time, at the same time protect it. So.
what is the balance between human and wildlife coexistence in this space? Oh, that's a big question to leave us on. Anybody else? <laughs> we got one. We got two more, and then we'll then we'll wrap things up. You have 10 seconds. I'm, ju I'm, just, a, I'm just a professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and it's, it's complicated, right? I mean, when these things need to go through uh, research and education and then management and then poli politics and then economics, it's like there's many, many, many steps that for things to happen, everybody needs to talking to each other and it has to, so I, I don't know the right answer to that. It's, it's complicated and it's like, it's complicated. It has, I think it's like communication. It has to be communication on all the different levels and all the people are taking decisions and, and somehow, yeah, education and communication between the different stakeholders or the different um, people that take decisions, so. We have one more. Okay, so, um, yes, this will find a way to make clones. And <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I feel very, uh, fortunately, very, um, I have really good collaborat collaborators, for example. Now the San Diego Wildlife Alliance is funding some botanical expeditions, and they are, like, paying for people to help me. So I'm able to have, like, um, bigger groups, because when I'm, just by myself, just by myself, I'm able just to have like groups of 15 people for a time, and when I have when I have help, uh, maybe 30 people, 30 people by time. So yeah, the collaborating had been key. Now I'm talking with um, Tamara, yeah, she's she's here, and we want to expand the idea to have like uh, botanical expeditions in Ensenada. So like replicate the idea and teach everything that I have learned in these three years, and, and uh, mm, yes, expand the idea and try to convince other person in other city in Baja California that they can use, I, I mean, it's not about me, it's not about the name Botanical Expedition, everyone, someone told me like, you should like put in like patent or something like that, I'm like, no, <laughs> use the name, use the native plants, just whatever you need to, to replicate the idea and be able to arrive to more people. So we are working on that, trying to, um, I'm trying to meet people like uh, in different cities around Baja. And if anyone is interested in doing the, what I'm doing, uh, I'm more than happy to teach them and that use all, what, all my resources to be able to replicate. Cause we really need it, but I still need help. I still need collaborators. So if anyone is interested, if anyone have funding or is interested in collaborating in the project, it's more than welcome. But I'm trying. I'm trying, and 
yeah, I, I hope one person in this audience is, is going to tell me like, hey, I'm good. I'm well. Actually, yeah, one person from San Diego told me like, hey, already happened. Yes, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> she told me like, hey, I'm from Tijuana. I, I was wondering who can help me to guide these people in, around Tijuana. So yeah, this kind of um, symposiums helps a lot to um, be able to um, the scope is bigger or something like that, yeah. Thank you. It's cloning the old-fashioned way, um, <laughs> replicating yourself by introducing the idea to others. That's great. Um, thank our panelists. They were wonderful. Um, and, and feel free to give yourself a round of applause, too. Um, discussions like this only work when people are engaged, and we love to see the engagement. Um, and uh, we love to see it here at the NAT. We love it at KPBS. Um, and I'm sure that our panelists um, appreciate the interest in their work. So thank you again for your time.